Our next speaker is Dr. Robin Alders. She comes to us from Australia. She has extensive experience in working with village poultry and village uh, poultry keepers in Africa and in Asia. She has taught at Tufts University, consulted with the FAO, and worked with the International Rural Poultry Center. Dr. Alders has championed the village poultry production and pioneering and the use of 1-2 vaccine to control Newcastle's disease under village conditions a work that is supported by USAID, or OSAID, sorry about that, the OSAID in Mozambique, Malawi, and Tanzania. And so let us all give a very warm welcome to Dr. Alders. Thank you. Abadi, it's uh, wonderful to be here today and to find so many of you who have decided to not only listen to goats, but also to listen to something about village chickens. That's very exciting. And uh, I'm very grateful to Erwin for this invitation. So um, as our chair mentioned, I've had the pleasure of wandering around Africa and Asia for about 20 years, working on the control of Newcastle disease. Um, but it's very important that I acknowledge that what I'm presenting is the work of a team. Many different people, many different disciplines, and most importantly, people who were willing to say when things were not going according to plan and to make some revisions. Um, I also, just as we get going, wanted to mention and to describe the system that we've done most of our work with when it comes to poultry. Um, in the, uh, the world of poultry, you have your commercial birds and, then, and your commercial operations. And then you have something that's called family poultry. So this is raising poultry, usually done by households, um, hence the name. But it's important to remember that at the household level, you can have different poultry production systems. And the systems have everything to do with the geography and with the people who are raising these birds. So most of our work is with extensive poultry, the ones that run around, find their own feed, often finding their own water. Uh, you can have semi-intensive production, where people will start to provide some supplementary feed, a little better quality housing. And then you can also have small-scale intensive production. Uh, the one on the right, this is actually a photo from Laos. And uh, you can see, can you see the wooden cages? And what can you see on top of the cages? So normally in a commercial operation, you would not find a rooster wandering around. But he's there because the farmer says it keeps the hens happier. <laughs> uh, and the important thing is, you, if you look at these different systems, as you move from extensive to intensive, you are increasing the inputs that are required to do it well. And with that, you are also increasing the risks. So that's one of the reasons we've chosen to stay pretty much with extensive or semi-intensive, is that it's a fantastic entry point for people who are very risk averse. So why did we start with village poultry? Basically because it's universally owned. As we know, as if you walk into a village and you don't see a chicken, something is really, really wrong in that particular location. To do intensive poultry production, you have to have essential inputs, such as balanced feed, such as medications, uh, access to clean water. Many of these inputs cannot be met in rural areas. In terms of livestock production, village chickens are among your most efficient. You put almost nothing in and you get something out. So when economists do their modelling, it drives them mad but village chickens always come out the most efficient because, as I say, very little goes in and you're still getting an output. In terms of the families that own them, they're critically important. Um, for those of you who work in villages, you know how it works. If the child have to go, has to go to school, it's the bird that's sold or bartered. If you need medicine to treat malaria, once again, it's the chicken that's sold. They help with pest control, they provide manure, and very importantly, they're very important with social credit. And in many uh, areas in sub-Saharan Africa, poultry usually fall under the supervision, 
control, sometimes ownership of women. And in terms of livestock, this is often the only livestock that they will have some say over. The other thing we don't often talk about, and what poultry give us, and for those of you coming from the US, you know that eggs have had a bad history in the past. People talked about cholesterol and how bad eggs were. Well, it just goes to show you can't believe everything you read in a paper. The early studies that were done on cholesterol, the equivalent that was fed to the monkeys was something like eating 120 eggs a day. Generally, we don't manage that. <laughs> but uh, if you think about it, when you have your egg, everything you need to produce your chick for the bones, for the feathers, for the skin, the meat, the muscle, everything is in that egg. That means it's an excellent source of protein, an excellent source of micronutrients, and very importantly, they're quite easy to keep, to store, to transport, so long as you can stop them from breaking. So a very good and high quality source of nutrients at the village level. When it comes to working with village poultry, because they have what is the most efficient system, they're still there after thousands of years after domestication, even though we give them very little attention, they are still there. So if we're going to ask people to do a little more, we have to be sure that it makes sense, that it is efficient, and that it's not actually going to be an increasing burden on them. Looking at issues of management, uh, supplementary feeding, marketing, access to information, all of this is very important. But really, for villagers that are used to seeing their birds die once or twice a year, they are reluctant to invest too much in those birds. It can be heartbreaking. You invest a lot and then the next day many of them are dead. So unless you can solve the Newcastle disease problem, very few families would see any benefit in doing, uh, investing time or energy above what they already do for their birds. And birds are usually part of mixed farming operations. So clearly you're not going to time your vaccination campaign with when people are out planting their fields because it's just started raining. You've got to figure all those things out with people ahead of time and make sure that what the work that you'd like to do with them fits around their already complicated schedule. How many of you had heard of Newcastle disease beef? No, yes, I'll, I'll make it easier. How many of you had heard of Newcastle before you walked into this room today? That's quite good. That's great. Um, do you know where the name comes from? In the English-speaking world, yes, the first report was Newcastle upon Time in England. The first re officially recorded outbreak was 1926 in Indonesia, and then some birds, the virus, hopped on a boat, and they got to the port in Newcastle. Um, transporters always had a, uh, a role with the transmission of uh, infectious disease. It's an endemic disease in many countries. It's caused by a virus. It comes from the same family as measles, same family as distemper. For those of you who love your cattle, same family as rinderpest. Um, and a number of years ago, interestingly, Australia has not had a major problem with virulent Newcastle disease, but they found out uh, a, a few decades ago that we actually have circulating, circulating strains of a virulent virus. The Australian poultry industry asked to be able to use some of those strains to develop a vaccine should they ever need to control virulent virus. And this is where the two strains come from that we call thermotolerant. Vaccines that are not only avirulent, meaning that they won't cause any side effects in the birds, but they also tolerate some breaks in the cold chain. You don't have to keep them constantly cold, and that makes them um, very useful in the village environment, where keeping products between two and eight degrees can be quite a challenge. In terms of Newcastle disease, it is, as a colleague of mine describes it, a silent tsunami. It's not reported in most of the countries where you are working. If you go to the international database, Newcastle disease is not reported, and yet er all of you know that each year birds are dying. The figures that you have here are conservative estimates. They're conservative estimates in terms of the cost of the bird, conservative estimates in terms of the actual mortality rate in the flocks, and yet it comes to a significant figure. 
and they're the direct costs. The question is, why haven't we done anything about it? I'm not sure. I'd like to think that the, the access to thermotolerant vaccine will help people to reconsider what you need to do and that it has become doable in rural areas. And uh, what we've found by rolling out the vaccine, in the early days of the work, the vaccine, um, the first vaccine, the V4 vaccine, became a patented vaccine, so you had to buy it from a commercial company. And it was found that many countries didn't have the foreign exchange to be able to import it. So the funding organisation, the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, went back and asked colleagues at the University of Queensland could they develop another strain that could be made freely available to countries that wish to produce it. And that's where the I2 vaccine came from. Very similar to V4, but it, not under any patent. For countries that wish to import it, they can do so to be able to meet their own needs in those areas. So as we've rolled out the program, um, we've come up with five key areas that really need to be addressed if it's going to be um, successful. And what I'm presenting to you today as number one, when I used to present this a couple of years ago, it used to be last, but I've simply decided that coordination is really the most important. Disease control is the mandate of government. We have to work with government. They want to see disease controlled. And they're the, the umbrella that gives continuity to all of our activities. So working with government, working with community groups, working with national veterinary services is critically important. You need to have a vaccine and, and vaccine technology that's appropriate. This is where the thermotolerant vaccine comes in because it can withstand some fluctuations in temperature. It is safe, so you can give it to day-old chicks and that means you have a very simple extension message. One bird, one drop is basically the way it works. With some commercial vaccines, you can't give them to young chicks. With others, you need to inject them. The use of needles all, uh, is a little more complicated in the rural setting. So having a vaccine that can be given via eye drop um, makes it quite easy to use. The extension material and methodologies, we were just really lucky, I think, with the work that we did that I happened to run into a social anthropologist who developed the same passion for, for village chickens. But it wasn't only the anthropologist who understood communication, who understood the importance of pre-testing material. We also had the good fortune to work with an artist who was simply willing to go back and redo images until we had something that was clear. Uh, he worked for a commercial firm, but he said, once again, the only work that he really liked was the village chicken work, more so than doing ads for the local brewery. Monitoring and evaluation is where we all learn. When we start out, we never really know what it is we want to do, and as we go along, we learn. And having the monitoring and evaluation approach that involves everyone, farmers, men and women within the community, distributors of vaccine, the animal health services, everybody's got to be involved in deciding what are their key indicators of success and then regularly checking to see if we are in fact meeting those indicators. And once again, it's got to be sustainable. For most countries, including my own of Australia, the animal health services never have enough money to do everything that they want to do. So the only way this work can be sustainable is if the farmer contributes. I know it, we're working with extremely poor people, but what we've learnt is that if you want it to be sustainable, they have to pay. If you want to run a program that will allow some subsidy, you've got to do it in parallel. There's got to be a separate program that targets the most vulnerable people who can't initially afford to pay. But ever, whoever produces the vaccine and whoever administers the vaccine needs to make money to cover their costs. Otherwise, it won't continue. Um, and then you, once people see, in your first campaign, not everyone's going to present their birds. Initially, they'll think you're a bit crazy that you want to vaccinate chickens if the children aren't regularly vaccinated. And even people who have a number of birds are never completely sure of your motives. So they won't put all of their birds out first to get them vaccinated. They'll give you a few chickens, and if they see that those chickens you vaccinated don't die, 
then they'll present more birds next time. Once they have more birds, once they stop dying, then you can work with people to decide if you've got extra birds, are you going to provide supplementary feed or are you going to start to consume and sell some of the eggs instead of having them all hatch? Wonderful discussions to follow up on. So basically, Newcastle disease control can be quite an exciting event for communities. So this is where the community vaccinator actually has sort of set up his own clinic here in this, this is in northern Mozambique where people would come by with their birds and he would vaccinate. Uh, and once again, as I mentioned, often in those mixed farming communities with crops, with chickens, things work very well. People can then go from having subsistence in terms of having a small number of birds that they're able to trade to actually thinking about um, much uh, larger numbers of birds and eggs being moved along the value chain. Once again, usually under the responsibility of women and children. In many um, communities, it's quite normal for a young child to receive a bird, to learn about caring for that bird, but also to have the responsibility to know when that bird or how that bird should be used to meet their own needs. On the left is Timor Leste, on the right is Tanzania, oh no, sorry, Mozambique on the right. The other thing that we did as we started to expand the work, we had the good fortune of a donor who insisted on gender equity. So instead of us going out and saying, we really think you need to have women um, being involved in this program, we could go out and say, listen, you know, it's our donor. They really think that we have to have a you know, significant representation of women. So in that initial pro process of selecting community vaccinators, we would work with communities and ask them to try and select some women that met the criteria that they were also involved with setting. Often, you know, if you've got 30% women to be trained in your first campaign, that was a great success. And then communities themselves would notice that, well, actually, these women are very persistent. They do work very long hours and they stay here. Men, as the head of the household, as the breadwinner, often have many pressures on them and they will often have to go off in search of other work or high, more highly paid work, whereas women tend to be more likely to be based with the home, based in the village. And so they're there and they provide a, a consistent and a persistent workforce. So when it came time to replace vaccinators that had fallen away, often communities would then preferentially select women. Cost efficiency is everything. We did our epidemiological studies using participatory techniques, finding out when outbreaks were more common so that we would be sure to start the vaccination campaigns in advance. Studies about cost recovery. So this is a book showing a uh, community vaccinator record book, um, numbers of birds vaccinated, payment received. Doing strategic vaccination. So there are different approaches across the world. Some people will simply say, we'll make the vaccine available, the householders can go and vac, or you can do mass vaccination campaigns where you mount the cold chain that you need to get your vaccine out at certain periods and you go out and you try to vaccinate as many birds as you can. That way, by doing that, it's more efficient in terms of having the focus on maintaining that cold chain. And cold chain means keeping things at a temperature. Most of your vaccines like to be kept between two and eight degrees. With this particular vaccine in the wet form, once it leaves eight degrees, you have two weeks so long as you can keep it under 30 degrees C. And in most places, by wrapping the vaccine in a damp cloth, transporting it in an open weave basket, you are able to keep it under 30 degrees and you're using material that's available locally to do so. And then you go back, you work with the communities, you work with the service providers to ensure that they're happy with the way things are going. We also work with labs not only to do the production of the vaccine, but if people import vaccine, they need to be able to do the test to confirm that the vaccine that they're receiving is of good quality. The sad fact is that many veterinary vaccines that are sold across Africa 
have very short shelf lives. Vaccines, when they're normally produced, have one to two years of a shelf life. What happens is as they start to reach their expiry date, they will be taken off sale and shipped to Africa where people will pay the same price but have a shorter lifespan. So being able to do your quality control in country to make sure that you're getting a vaccine that's good quality, very important. Um, I mentioned the extension materials. Uh, these are three that are available for download off the internet. Basically, they document all the lessons we've had to learn along the way. We'd really like to sa save you some time and save you some heartache. We also have an extension manual um, that covers diseases and production aspects beyond Newcastle Disease Control. And we have a range of support material from flip charts to the vaccination calendar. And I should say the vaccination calendar, when we first designed it, was all about emphasising the months when we should vaccinate. What we found was that farmers very quickly understood when they needed to vaccinate. We then had to have activities in the other months to make sure that the vaccine got to the village when it was needed. There are general extension materials that are also available from a newsletter. We've got flip charts that talk about parallel interests that women have, healthy um, chickens, healthy people. Women are usually the carers across the house, uh, all the, the, the different species that are under one roof. Um, also talking about chicken reproduction, that flip chart came about simply from working in villages where there were high rates of HIV, where young children were not able to learn about um, normal things that go on from their parents. And they'd say, I've got this hen here, it's four months, when is it going to start to lay eggs? That was the origin of this particular flip chart, which goes on to do a little more as I'll talk about it. In all of our material, we include information on HIV AIDS, simply because we were asked to do so. When we started and working with veterinary services, they said it's all very well to talk about keeping our chickens alive. We'd also like to have our workforce um, being protected. And in those days, a lot of the HIV AIDS material were just short, sharp bites with no actual information behind them to help people understand processes about how you prevent it or how you live with it. So for a lot of our um, material at national level, we do include that information in the extension worker manuals and in the vaccinator manuals. And as I say, this material, you can just, um, they're free for download. And what I would say is if you do download it, if you do read it, and if you have comments, please let us know. We're in the process of revising the field and the training manuals, and so we'd really love to have your feedback over the next couple of months. I'd like to just run through some of the impact of work that we've done over the years. This was uh, now a couple of years ago, but what you see is the change. This is working with communities to identify problems. We tend to work in same-sex groups so that everyone's, um, well, so that it's easier for people to be able to speak. And what you see is at the start of this particular project, for village chicken farmers, Newcastle disease was the most important problem. Three years later, not even ranked among the men, and for women, its importance had really fallen away. That's quite a dramatic change. And what do they do with those extra chickens? Lots of things is the answer, uh, even down to occasionally buying beauty products or mattresses or all those essential things that sometimes it's very hard to do. And this is for the people who love to work with goats. Your sustainable way of being able to work with your goat, treat your goat, is to have your chickens. With five roosters, you can buy a goat. And what we see at the village level is quite a remarkable transformation that if relations are pretty good within the household and it's recognised that those roosters were raised and cared for by the woman and that she then trades that rooster, the goat that she buys is also hers. And that's quite a change. So some of the direct outputs is that you, if you can maintain that vaccination, and we recommend every four months because you never know when the outbreak is coming, farmers, both men and women, learn a lot more about disease, about how you prevent it, how you control it. 
and food security and well-being is um, greatly improved. And now, if we can get the technology to work, what I'd like to do is show you a short video. This was shot in Singida in Tanzania, and the, our country coordinator, Dr. Halif Msami, so for any of you who work in Tanzania, as Irwin did, um, Msami knows everything about Newcastle Disease Control, and it's really what you see in this video is thanks to his efforts. in the English-speaking world actually occurred in Newcastle upon Tyne in England and so that's how it's sort of known as Newcastle disease but everywhere you go it has its own local name and it was causing huge mortality and impacting dramatically on farmers lives <laughs> Ukohoa sana kuku na kutoa ute mzito. Kwa hiyo kuna unaweza kachukua hata siku mbili au moja tu nakuta kuku wote wameisha. Mimi nilikuwa najisikia vibaya nikiona kuku wangu wanaisha hivyo nikawa nafikiria nifanyeje na tafuta kila aina ya njia ya dawa sipati na watakuwa tayari katika ufadhili wa mradi ambao utashughulikia lishe ya watoto. It's a vaccine that could cope with village conditions where we don't always have refrigeration and also a vaccine that was safe enough to be able to give to birds of all ages. So it goes from the lab out through the provinces and districts and it's finally administered by community vaccinators who are able to receive a small fee for administering the vaccine to the farmer's birds. Furahia sana, na changa ta kuku kwa subui kumi, au jioni na changa ta kaya tano. Ash is a very special lady. She is our star vaccinator. I think in the last campaign in May, she vaccinated 1,500 birds. Akuna dawa, wala kinga wakatu ali kwa akuni. Taki ni pasa sahi tu mepata kinga, kuku anendelea vizuri tu nashukuru. Poultry meat and eggs are really fantastic sources of high quality um, nutrients. Kikwa tuapi mbekula vina vyoto kana na maya na zala kuku kama maya i na matokea ke matumbo elkuwe na kuwa makubwa sabada ya kupata mafunzo tu kwa tumiano umuhimu wa kuelimisha kina mama juu ya lishe bora kwa watoto kuyo lo tatizo ni lishe. One special thing about village poultry is that they're often the only livestock that women have some say over, some control over in their life. And so being able to give them some certainty about their assets is really quite transformational. <laughs> Nimesha badilisha na mbuzi kwa mdau wa nne kwa awamu hii ya ya chanjo ya mwezi wa 5. Once we had that model, Ozay then agreed to fund the expansion of the work. So it went from Mozambique, Tanzania, Malawi, Zambia, working across a larger number of countries, but really ensuring that the model was sustainable. Manzoni kabisa nilikuwa kwenye hicho kibanda cha nyasi hapa. Hata nyumba si nilikuwa sijajenga nilikuwa nakaa kwenye tembe. Lakini baada ya mafanikio ya hii miaka mitatu nimeweza kujenga haya mabanda ya kuku. Nimeweza kujenga nimefungua hapo kwa biashara yangu. Nyumbani nene nimeshajenga. IPTC watu zaidi ya watano wananiuliza juu ya ufugaji wa kuku na ni nini siri ya mafanikio? Iliamua kuanzisha kikundi cha wafugaji wa kuku. Sanya mayai kwa pamoja 
tunauza mayai yasiyopungua 800 mara yanafikia hadi 1000 kwa hawa watu kumi. We have had a request from the African Union Vaccine Center to work with them now to build capacity both in terms of vaccine production and quality control. And I'm pleased that the Australian International Food Security Center is also funding to enable us to build on some of the successes we've had. Uh, in Singida, Dr. Musami is known as the saviour of Singida. He's a very impressive man. All right. So, for those of you who want to, it's actually on YouTube. It's the first time, possibly, that village chickens have made it to YouTube. Uh, uh, we worked um, with funding from FAO in the centre of Mozambique, and they asked us to go in and do a Newcastle Disease Control Program to help the community. What we found was that the families that were hardest hit by the disease actually had no birds. When there's a funeral, as you know, you have to feed everybody, so the birds went quite quickly. So we, on the side, organised a restocking program so that households that were identified within the community as being most vulnerable received one rooster and three hens, and they also had vouchers. So for the first two campaigns, they got free vaccination, but by signing the, va the voucher, the vaccinator was able to get paid for doing that work. And the vaccinators there were actually also the same volunteers that help with home care of HIV AIDS um, patients. We did training with the families that were going to receive those birds before they arrived to make sure that they had the basics of husbandry and also that they had a, a mentor within the community with whom they could talk if they had problems as things went on. And what we saw was a, a significant increase. We also um, worked with local primary schools to um, provide information about disease control, but this particular one is in association with uh, reproduction. Any idea what we're doing here? My flash is on, so normally this was quite dark. We had a... Anybody here who raises eggs? Candling. Candling, exactly. So when you pass a light through an egg, you are able to see what's going on in that egg. And in fact, if there's a developing embryo in there, you will be able to see that. By day five or day six, once the egg's under the hen, you take it out for a short space of time. You can either use a commercial candling lamp or a, a lamp or a jerry-rigged uh, lamp as we've made here, and you can see whether that egg that's under the hen is actually fertile. And so if you candle and you see no embryo, what are you going to do with that egg? Yep, it's an omelette or a boiled egg, whatever. So, and the kids were fascinated by this. It's really interesting. When you talk with adult communities, they're all interested about Newcastle disease. When you talk with children all over the world, they're always interested in reproduction. So, so when this program was reviewed uh, by an independent consultant, they found that the Newcastle work had three benefits at the community level. It directly supported the households it provided an income for those who had been involved with volunteer um, ca caring activities and it increased the carrying capacity of the community as a whole to be able to deal with those increased numbers of, of uh, orphans and uh, people that are unable to work. So that was um, quite remarkable. But as they love to say in the commercial, wait, there's more. So. Village chickens not only help with HIV AIDS mitigation, they're also improved production is being used with communities that are nearby national parks. They, uh, when I show this in Australia, people kind of like this, but they all love this. They love the animals, but the fact of the matter is the people and the animals live together for a very long time and uh, sustainable harvesting of wildlife is also sometimes possible, but what you can do by improving poultry production is mean that 
basic needs for, for meat and for food security are met and so um, the need to hunt wild animals becomes less. I started my experience in Africa in 1989 at the University of Zambia and uh, for many of the field trips I travelled with Mr Banda, whom you can see here. We talked a lot along the way and uh, he was always fascinated with my ideas. So I'm glad to be able to share his ideas with you. I don't think I need to say any more. The work has uh, moved on. There are other people working here in Tanzania, in West Africa, using the same model. But the work, this particular work was in South Luangwa, an area where there's tsetse fly, so raising cattle was not so obvious, not so uh, possible. They knew they had a problem with Newcastle. We had funding from Cornell Wildlife Conservation Society, and this was actually USAID money to have this going. At this stage, they had to import the vaccine from Malaysia. Um, most of the cost went in transport rather than the cost of the vaccine. And I'm pleased to say that Zambia is now making their own vaccine and it's in the process of being registered. But this work is ongoing. We had a very small involvement um, several years ago now and the work continues without our support. These numbers in South Luanga where you see changes in household flock size, it may not seem like much, but this is quite transformational because this is a standing flock. There have been many birds, birds that have been sold and uh, eaten, and having this standing flock means that you can do something as crazy as eat one. Because normally when we start, families might only have one or two or three birds, and the idea of eating one of them is just a luxury they can't afford because they might have to trade it to buy medicine tomorrow. So the general outcomes, I, um, I won't bore you, but I have a presentation where I show how um, village chickens contribute to each of the eight Millennium Development Goals. And also in Mozambique, we went from being the crazy people who wanted to vaccinate chickens to now being part of the ruling party's platform, all chickens shall be vaccinated. We have endorsement here in Tanzania. The government is actually has contributed to scaling up their production facilities and rolling out this model of using community vaccinators and community um, mass vaccination campaigns to additional areas in the country. We have a number of donors and NGOs and certainly Owen has been a great collaborator along the way. And as mentioned in the video, we're partnering now with the African Union to roll this out uh, to additional countries and to get accredited master trainers on both the field and the lab side so that the work can spread and uh, be done under the banner of the African Union. For those of you who are interested, these are the countries where the vaccine, the master seed exists. In some countries, it's more readily available than others. Some of them are just getting going. I do know that there are some of you here um, from South Sudan vaccine is not available there, but I know the Director of Veterinary Services in South Sudan is very keen to do something, and I'd be very happy to give you his contact. Importing the vaccine, it doesn't cost a lot to, to get programs up and uh, off the ground. If you want further information, I'm happy to, to talk with you. Also, my colleague, Mary Young, who's based in Brisbane, she does more of the lab side. I kind of like the field side, and she um, she works with folk in the lab on quality control activities and training. So, thank you very much. <laughs>